this year. Facebook test it if it works either. latest one.
We also invited her uh, specifically. I have Facebook up. I did Facebook. I did the uh, the Google group. Okay, are we all right? We're good. We okay. Okay, so shall we get started? Okay, good. All right, we are. So just so people know, you know, you know, it would have been fun. It's just to, just to scare everybody. It's like we should have had one of those anonymous masks, you know. <laughs> so like when it streams, you know, ah, <laughs> it's those guys. Okay. Okay. Are we going? All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. 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 Hi. Uh, welcome to the um, annual meeting of the Animation Educators Forum. Uh, I'm, my name is Tom Cito, and I'm the uh, Chair of Animation and Digital Arts here at the University of Southern California, uh, where we are um, uh, hosting the event uh, today. And uh, thank you very much to the university for uh, uh, supplying us this nice space. And uh, it's a Saturday morning here. Uh, we are streaming. And I think we're also going to be connected with Google with uh, a number of schools across the country and across North America. So um, if anybody's listening on that side, they'd be invited to uh, ask questions or participate. You know, we'll keep it sort of an open forum. Be a, a, a number of other uh, professors say that they that they intended to tune in to the stream as well. So um, basically, the this organization started about. What do you think about 10, 10 years ago? Wow, 10 years. Jeez. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, basically the idea was, you know, you know, when I began my career in the 70s, there was just a little bit of, anim you know, there was a little bit of animation taught at CalArts. There was a little bit of animation at NYU, a little bit at SVA and at Sheridan. And that was it pretty much. You know, there, there was very little to, to to look at. Now there's so many schools doing animation courses and doing courses in also in connection with, with new technologies. And um, you know, when this group assembled, we just realized that just in the Southern California area alone, there's so many different schools from, you know, uh, you know, San Bernardino to the Channel Islands and from Valencia to San Diego, all teaching animation and animation teachers don't talk to one another. And we thought that's kind of odd, you know. You know, I mean, it's it's nice to get together and talk shop a little bit, you know, and compare notes and all. So why not? Um, so we put this organization together, and it's it's still a bit loose, but you know, we've we've learned a lot over the years in in assembling this thing, and um, and uh, you know, we've known now to to go you know national and even internationally when the um, 
when we uh, uh, you know uh, in in planning events and uh, coming up with an itinerary for this organization. Uh, so basically, yeah, we want to try to have like a, a general membership meeting like this at least once a year, just to uh, uh, again to touch base with everybody. Uh, I thought what we would uh, what we decided to talk about this morning, and the first part of the uh, of our event, is to talk a little bit about virtual reality. Now, again, when I started in animation in the 70s, the, the, the hot elective or like the, the, the cool thing that everybody wanted was, was editing videotape. <laughs> like, remember that? It was like concepts, you know, advanced concepts in video. Ooh, <laughs> you know, chroma key. Ooh, <laughs> like that was like the hot thing, you know. And now that's like the the dinosaur period, you know. It's so far far back, but uh, especially since the digital revolution, animation has kind of moved into the center of mo our modern digital media. You know, you know everything. Uh, everything comes in or is tied to uh, animated filmmaking in one form or another. All all our modern filmmaking is dependent on it now, and 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 like a lot of uh, um, a, a lot of uh, digital filmmaking nowadays, everything's dependent on the newer technology and advancements. And we've seen in the past few years one of the things that's really come on strong is is VR, is virtual reality. And a lot of people are talking about how to teach virtual reality and, and, and uh, you, you know, how expansive is it? Is it going to be a flash in the pan like 3D? Like everybody was all excited about 3D for a little while and then went, eh. You know, or is this like the media of the future? Uh, uh, we've talked to a number, a, a number of uh, instructors and, uh, and all. We've talked about this. And, it's, and we're kind of saying we're basically in the Lumiere stage of, of VR. You know, we're in the train goes into a tunnel stage, <laughs> like, but we're teaching the John Fords and the Walt Disney's and the Cecil B. DeMille's of this medium that are going to make sense out of it. You know, so I thought uh, um, one of the ways to start uh, uh, the discussion is to bring in uh, two experts who are, are, are sort of on the advanced edge of where VR is going um, right now, at least in education. And... Um, one is uh, right next to me. Is uh, is uh, I got this one. I need my I need my glasses. I, I just forget your last name, Andy. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so, and Andy Fedek, associate professor of animation at Cal State Fullerton. So this is Andy. There we go. And next to him is uh, Eric Hansen, who's associate professor of animation digital arts at, here at USC. There you go. So uh, I thought what I'd do is I would turn it over to them and, and then they could talk a little bit about where VR has come from and where it is right now and, uh, and, and what's the latest. So I'll, uh, Andy, why don't you start off? Okay. Should I just talk? Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Andy. Um, so I guess to just give you a little bit of a background on me, um, my background is more... Oh, I should go back here. Um, and do we have access to a computer? Like I could show some stuff too, or should we just talk about it? Yeah, I could show that. Okay, so I guess maybe I'll just talk a little bit about my background. So I come from more of a visual effects, experimental um, animation background. And so my work traditionally was extracting kind of methods from like Industrial Light Magic or Pixar. And then um, instead of like robots and like transformers, you know, I would insert in kind of weird conceptual art experimental kind of stuff. Um, and so I've been always really interested in that edge of technology and what you could do with it. Um, and so uh, for a long time, I thought VR, at first I wasn't as interested in it um, because it seemed a little bit like the flash in the pan kind of thing. Um, and then um, I had a, a chance to have a museum show in um, at Cal State LA at the Luckman Gallery there. And I had a whole museum that I had to interface with. So traditionally, I would show my work um, as um, like films using stereography or just regular 2D. And um, so now I had this whole space I had to, to work with. And so I looked at you know doing 3D prints and doing kind of sculptural stuff, but I'd never really made anything in real life. And so I began to think about, OK, you know, I'm kind of getting away with what I'm good at, which is making fake stuff look real, right? And so I started to look at VR 
and and at that time there was this moment where vr started to get really cool and vr started to really interface with visual effects where the same tools that i was using for my films i could use um, for vr and that's uh, the light fields and then also what's known as presence it's like a basically a point cloud based system to render um, into, into VR and then play it back at 24 frames a second. And so what I ended up doing was digitize the museum and insert in um, objects into the space that you could move around and check out, right? And so it was this kind of culmination of connecting these worlds together that was really fascinating to me. Um, so I think right now we're getting to this place where like that was, I was using the beta and it was like last minute and it was really crazy and it was, you know, I, I, I made it work, but now we're starting to see things that um, it's going to much more accessible. Um, it's not beta anymore. The cameras are coming out, which um, are really fascinating. Um, and I'm sure um, Eric could talk about this stuff too, but I'm just really excited about the potential um, for students to now get access to it. And what it means to work in this way. And the, I think we touched upon it a little bit um, last time we spoke, which is just the, the medium and what it offers um, and what are the kind of pitfalls that we run into. So anyway, I'll hand it over to Eric for a bit. All right, thanks. Is this uh, testing on on your switch? Uh -huh. This guy? Uh, we have power. We have power. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Tom and Andy. Uh, my name is Eric Hansen. I think I met many of you at CTN, perhaps. last Was that last summer? Okay. Great. Oh, was it November? Okay, great. Um, well, so just to update you, a lot has happened in VR since November. Um, it just, it's uh, just a remarkable uh, kind of bubble that's occurring right now with VR. Um, VR, I would say, is, in my estimation, it's nothing short of a revelation for anybody working in film or media. I mean, it really is such an expansive uh, type of area for all of us to be involved in. Students have seen the light on this, uh, you know, instantly. So we have just a massive surge of interest here at SC and in VR and a lot of the VR tech, the current headset tech was kind of developed here on the research side. So Oculus kind of stems from the work done by Mark Bolitz here. But uh, but we're just now kind of instigating a sense of the cinematic, uh, you know, uses or explorations of VR here in animation. And uh, we also just put in the Jaunt Lab, which is Jaunt creates uh, kind of the cutting edge camera tech for VR, so I'm working with them in my own work, and then also they've, they've come in as a donor here and are providing some of their cameras to our students. So it's just an amazing moment in time right now where the students have all these resources and interest, and of course there's just a huge explosion going on. I mean, if you want, I could show you slides a little later that I put together to just kind of talk about the bubble that's happening. But, uh, but the great thing is it is becoming more accessible. It still always takes a few minutes to like get the headset working and set it up. I mean, that part of it, it's not casual yet. It's still kind of, uh, you know, a little clumsy to, to observe it. But the experience of seeing what uh, VR can do, especially in animation, is pretty much untapped. I mean, and everybody's uh, exploring it now for 360 video and for real-time graphics, more on the gaming side. And that has, obviously, all kinds of use. But, uh, but really, I think for animation, it's, it's still, in my mind, is totally untapped. And uh, I did a studio. That's why I was wondering when CTN was, because I did a studio last fall that I kind of took them down this rabbit hole, and these are incoming MFAs, so they had some skills coming in, but not real heavy on the 3D side. And I, I'm, I work in 3D animation. I have a visual effects background as well. And uh, so I, I kind of, that's my desired platform to work with it, but we also integrate photography and scan objects and such. But, uh, but anyway, I took them down this rabbit hole, and I said, well, I'll kind of handle the heavy lifting of, you know, doing the, the Maya work for you. You can conceptualize it. We can, you know, help you on the creative side. And uh, I didn't really know what to expect, but at the end of the, the uh, term, we've got, we got some really remarkable pieces. I was pretty stunned, actually, and I think they're, they're pretty significant. So they're going to be looping. I guess we could, I don't know, Tom, you want to just wait till the end for that, or do you want to loop them now? Uh, I mean, we could... 
Let's Either uh, way. Yeah, let's give it Maybe a little wait time. Maybe wait after some bit talk. Get, get a couple of questions. Okay. And then we'll, then we'll yeah, there you go. That. So anyway, so we'll have it to show you today. So you can look at some of these pieces. And they're all shorts. They're like 20 to 30 minutes. One student did a four-minute piece. But um, but really beautiful work. And I was, was really kind of amazed at what the potential would be. And these were students that really were just, you know, just trying the waters out. So nobody that, uh, you know, had a serious background with it or with 3D animation. Um, so anyway, so it's been a lot of fun to kind of get it started. And then I've started this class that slides kind of washed out behind me, but it's an immersive class here that it used to be a stereoscopy class. So I include a little bit of stereo, the basics of that taught in this new IMAX theater that we have. And then, uh, then I take them over into full dome, which is a media that I've worked in for a number of years and planetarium domes that have replaced their projector, star projector with digital projectors. And there's a subculture of artists that work in that medium, a lot of animators, um, small though it is. And then, uh, and then we end up the, the, uh, the semester in VR. So um, that class, I started it a year ago, and this semester it exploded. So I put my other class on the shelf, and I'm teaching two sections of it now just to kind of meet the need of what's happening. And again, we're just starting it. So it's really, really exciting because all the, the, uh, the VR work that's happened here at USC, there's a storied past of it here but it's all kind of more on the interactive side and the research side and not really, you know, hugely cinematic. So for, for me, this is kind of the beginning of cinematic VR here. And then we're hoping to ignite the same thing on the production side with a VR or I'm sorry, with the jaunt camera. So that's kind of what's, what's happening here. We're, we're hoping to kind of, you know, instigate a, a small uprising with this mm. stuff. Can can you define um, the differences between stereoscopy and 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 the VR you're doing currently? Well, it plays uh, the 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 stereo class plays right into VR. Kind of, it's an on, an, an entry point for it. Mm. Um, stereo actually in VR, the the concerns that you have with flat media really disappear. A lot of the framing and the window edging and all that. Um, fall away. There's still the, you know, convergence issues and IA interaxial and so forth. Mm -hmm. But really what VR means in, uh, or stereo means in VR is really just an issue of scale. Are you an insect or are you a Goliath? You know, and it's, it's really so, and there's a test that I do where I hold my hand out and it, unfortunately it's very empirical. There's, it's not as scientific um, as it can be in flat, but I hold my hand out and I, in with the VR goggles and I kind of feel, does this feel correct? And that's kind of my test for it. You may have your own technique, Andy. Well, I, I think it's an interesting kind of question to think about what exactly is VR. You know, I feel like there's some different interpretations and maybe we could even have the conversation about because, you know, there's the shooting a dome where it's like a, from a single point in space where it's traditionally was done for production. You know, is that VR, you know, and if is that done in stereo or not in stereo, you know, then you that's a whole nother level. And then there's the what we're seeing with the jaunt camera you know we're actually creating a point cloud system or light fields right where it's actually you can move your head around and all that kind of stuff is that vr you know so there's a lot of really interesting i think um kind of interpretations of what you know official vr is and i think when um cameron was getting really up up um, doing avatar and really pushing stereoscopy um, and stereoscopic production he was really like you got to do it right you got to do it right you know and sometimes i wonder you know is pushing saying like you know we need to say like what is true vr you know like where the jaunt camera is capturing this really amazing image you know as a compared to you know shooting with you know a whole rig of a bunch of cameras you know at once right and how that's different i think a lot of people don't know that difference you know it's kind of hard to even describe it you know but it really gives you this amazing it's almost like if you hear them talk about light fields it's like ray tracing like they're actually calculating all the normals of the geometry in the space you know which is like mind-blowing kind of computationally rather than just like these two domes that you're looking in that you can't move your head around in you know so i think there's an it's an interesting kind of um, issue that I think um, if for teachers because the dome method is really approachable you know from a from you don't need a jaunt camera mm. and we would love one at Fullerton if by the way that'd be really cool. oh I'll mention that to yeah. you. <laughs> it feels like donating out there yeah but I yeah. it's really special because that that's really literally the cutting edge 
of the technology right now. And I, I think it's really special that you guys have access to it, you know, to play around. Yeah, that I mean, just just to clarify, it is just a video camera. There's not anything beyond that. They, oh. they Sometimes it's described as a light field camera, but that's a little erroneous. It's really oh. just a very, very well done stereo oh, 360 okay. camera. Just oh, so wow. you know. But the uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the first thing to understand about VR is the the uh, the avenues or kind of the realms of it. And for the longest time, it's been the domain of real time. So for unity or unreal or any gaming engine work, because that, that exports right into a headset, you don't have to render it, you get perfect stereo because the objects are there. And as a result, and that's what goes on at SCI here, interactive media here and has for years. And it's, it's, you know, it's of great use and, and import. Um, but it's not necessarily cinematic. It may be more on the gaming side, though that's up to the artist really to dictate. But the other side that has been evolving is, uh, actually most of it is 360 video, which is really just a cluster of GoPro cameras mostly used, um, though they're very problematic. And that allows you to record video, but like uh, like uh, we were saying, it's from a stationary point of view. So there's no, you can't, there's no, no leaning experience. You can't lean around, you can't move around, you can look anywhere. So it's called orientational freedom. You can look in it, and that's what you'll see here on our demo. And, uh, and But that's different from a real-time engine where you can actually can walk around. So the latest headset with that is called the Vive. It's an amazing uh, unit, and I just got one in my studio, and you can walk around in about a 10-foot cube and really interact with characters and your environment i have a, a, a proposal i did to lacma that has some of this stuff i could show it's like five minutes long or do you want to wait till later i don't know we, we can talk can show it in a minute yeah, okay yeah, we'll yeah because later. it's i think the vibe and the idea of walking around the space is an interesting one too because particularly like how do you make a movie or tell a story in that you know like if you edit the person's going to be in a different location completely, you know, so it becomes really kind of an interesting problem as uh, cinematic. Yeah. yeah. So, talking about these, these uh, dome shows and all those as well, I uh, reminded me of a, of a completely superfluous tangent I like to throw in. Uh, <laughs> Which I'm good Thanks. at superfluous stuff, but um, but uh, uh, you know um, I wrote a history of computer graphics, still available on Amazon. Uh, and uh, <laughs> but but one of the things I noticed when I was writing it was that some of the early breakthroughs in in the interactivity, whatever it was, um, early rock shows like light shows and stuff. You know where you have the band, or whatever, in a club, and 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 people would be doing graphics behind the musicians in in in, in real time. So, and I think the earliest one is like 19. 56 where like uh, uh you know high hirsch was putting images behind dizzy gillespie in san francisco so at, at a club but uh, uh I, what's interesting is that that also ties into the dome displays and shows and, and 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 i always thought somebody could write that subject is so dense somebody could write a book just on that just on just on rock shows and and tom knows i'm terrible at rock and roll so 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 if anybody out there wants to write that book you're welcome to take the idea and go with it you know because I'd, I'd love to read it one day but um getting getting back on on track uh, <laughs> um uh, which, uh, how do you uh, what do you think is the is the current status of of narrative in in, in vr Mm, let's see. Well, that's the big question. Um, so, again, you have to look at it in what vehicle we're talking about, whether it's real time. And uh, the thing, and by the way, just let me mention this, that the good news about all this is that from an educational standpoint, it's become uh, accessible now at a, at a lower level. Like the question, I was on a panel yesterday, we had a big VR event here. What's the easiest way I can get started? Well, for $300, you can buy a thing called the Theta camera, Rico Theta. And it's a very simple, it's kind of two small cell phone cameras on a wand. And that will directly upload to your phone, which you can then use as a headset. So you can begin to explore kind of narrative storytelling in an editorial fashion using captured, you know, it's basically just a video camera, but it's very inexpensive. Low resolution, albeit, but but still reasonable to, to begin. Um, but then above that, then you can get into GoPro cameras all the way going up to the John camera from a, from a cinematic standpoint. But for us as animators, since November, there's a great new software package come out called Skybox for After Effects. So if your students know After Effects, it's a way for them to render into what's called a latitude longitude image, which is basically a spherical map, kind of like a world Mercator map. And that's the current format that we, we work in. 
So, uh, and it has to have a very precise distortion. So you, uh, you know, and I give them actually a perspective grid, a lat long perspective grid. And I've had students that hand draw into that perspective grid, which isn't one interesting way to do it. But if you already know After Effects, the, the barrier for entry now is pretty low uh, to get into it, to begin to work in After Effects like you normally do, but you're working now in a spherical world and you can output and that software is very inexpensive i think it's about 200 dollars they they you know the guy behind it is you know canvassing all the schools so you could easily do a deal with him i'm sure but uh, but anyway so that's that's so the barrier for entry for video is low and now it is for animation with that with that uh, application and of course i i teach maya technique but that's more demanding on the students but uh, so but but there is this kind of cascade or kind of increasing level of technical you know expertise that's required um, by the time you go up if you want real time you have to learn unity or unreal but all these are fair game for education um, but back to your your thing back to uh, narrative it depends on what avenue of that you want to explore the question and the jaunt lab here at sc is founded what why they're doing that i believe is to explore what narrative can and you know may be evolve into in vr it's a huge open question there's going to be an awful lot of really awkward, uh, you know, kind of terrible work, actually, unfortunately, for a while until these things are really discovered. And there's all kinds of ses sessions and papers written and websites and there'll be books and everything exploring what is the nature of narrative in this when you are first person, right? So, it's so, so you're no longer abstracted, uh, objectified. So it's uh, nothing is objectified. You're immersed in it as a first person viewer. So it's a, it's an, a really interesting time to right. see where that'll go. Yeah, just to, to follow up, in, it, just from a technical side with the um, rendering, um, the two renderers that we use Arnold at Fullerton, which is a Sony Pictures Imageworks renderer. And there's a pre, um, it's like a plugin where you can render to, um, uh, to the, uh, basically to a um, panoramic image, right? And then and then a lot long with both eyes at the same time. And it's really great and it, it works and I've used it. And it's, so it's pretty accessible too and it's free. And um, same, I think there's a V-Ray version of it too. Yeah, and so, um, so there's that, and so that's really accessible. So you can right now, you're not. It's still, you know, it's not a point cloud. It's a, it's a flat image, like you shot it with multiple cameras, but um, it still definitely gets you started and gets and it's exciting for the students to explore that. Um, and I think from the the narrative standpoint, you know, I've seen proposals like um, last year at LACMA that for the art and tech, there was a proposal where someone would take on the personality of. I think it was like a, an immigrant from Syria that it, it was really kind of interesting, kind of an exploration. And then this also this idea the New York Times did with um, the um, I think they were like a cheaper kind of like um, that went out with the actual Times cardboard. Yeah, where you could go and you'd be it's like a I think a, a still image where you can explore the image. And there's certain kind of sense of empathy that you would get from that. It's not exactly narrative as much it is kind of um, an interesting exploration of how people identify with an image, particularly if you're like inserted into a space and kind of explore it on your own where you're not kind of told to look in this one direction versus direction. Um, but I, I still think there's like Felix and Paul, like those guys are really kind of starting to do it. And you're seeing a lot of um, festivals starting to explore it too, like Sundance. Um, is doing a lot of work there. Um, Sherry Frilo is an interesting curator that's doing that kind of work. And then the Sheffield DocFest is also doing stuff. I think the Shoah Foundation is doing stuff with you guys or somebody at USC. Um, what's up? ICT, um, where it's really interesting kind of digitizing. Um, I think um, probably you could probably describe it better than me with people that were um, from the, um, the time in the camps and stuff like that and where you can experience this person and get to talk to them. Or stuff like oh that. my goodness. Yeah, it's really impressive. Yeah, digital Dachau. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really kind of connecting to it and cool. stuff. It's really, but it, it gets into, um, outside of VR, I think it's even like light stage kind of stuff where it's like scanning a 3D volume, you know? But it's, it's interesting where it's like, I think the doc stuff is really, or excuse me, the narrative um, exploration of this medium is kind of where what I think we're doing you know, and like we're starting to explore the student, the kids are going to do it because mm -hmm. it's, I think that there's no clear space other than festivals to show it and make money off of it. Right. You know what I mean? And I, and so it kind of is 
on our docket, you could say, because we're we're just kind of there for the fun of it, quote unquote, or whatever, you know. So yeah, the thing is, I mean, the uh, a lot of this depends on the proliferation of the headsets. And up to now, I, we've been developing in it for more than two years, probably, though we've been doing spherical work in full dome for a long time. But that, uh, but within the last two years, if you go to all these events, VRLA or what have you, there's a proliferation of all of them. Um, it's really developers showing other developers' work. So it's kind of, we're our own audience. Um, but now, if you are uh, if you know, the Oculus, uh, official Oculus headset consumer releases come out as well as the Vive. So now there's there's now sales made to the general public. Um, there's proliferation of these cardboard headsets, which is a Google standard. And uh, so this year is kind of the beginning of the growth of the audience. And it will it'll continue for probably four or five years until, as somebody said, you know, at what point we walk into somebody's home and see a headset in their living room, you know, next to the TV. So that's, you know, when will it be ubiquitous? And that's probably, everybody kind of figures it's probably four or five years to that point. So the question is, as a creator, how do you, how will you maintain, how will you, uh, you know, uh, sustainably create your work during that time if there's no revenue stream? Because in the end, the beauty of VR, from my standpoint, that I'm super thrilled by if it really works out this way, is that um, you could build your own direct relationship to your your audience directly through an app store paradigm and potentially be remunerated for the work directly and bypass the studio system and you know a sense of control. So that to me seems really democratic and really exciting. Um, so if I could build up my own uh, following or channel and I get uh, enough funding to fund the next project, that would just be a terrific way for a creator to work. But um, but that's the promise. The reality is they're calling it the the VR winter, or I call it the walk across the desert for the next few years. How are you going to make it? So uh, our we have different different companies have different approaches on it. We're partnering up with companies like John to to help fund some of the work and and do the work, and then we're developing our own IP uh, that we're looking to go get some funding for. So we're we're kind of exploring different avenues for that as uh, as a small studio ourselves. Yeah, I, I think. It, this the museums and art spaces are starting to be aware of it and, and festivals there's a bit of a front end that you have to kind of pay for a lot of this stuff and we could talk a little bit about the the the, the actual different um head mounted displays you know that might be something like there's um the oculus which you guys are probably familiar with right and that's what 600 bucks yeah and then so that that one so you can move your head around right and then there's the gear which is like which is that right over there right yep where you pop in the it's a specific type of samsung, samsung that you pop in the, and you can look around but you can't move your head around right mm -hmm. and then and that's what 400 uh, it's actually a hundred dollars oh, for wow. the viewer oh well wow. at okay. best buy yeah right now which okay. is great but but it's a it's a vehicle to uh to pawn uh you know samsung phones so it's clearly yeah. a device for that yeah and so and then you know this is student that's more affordable we can kind of and then um and then there's the vive which is 800 900 uh 800 800 so yeah. the vibe is cool is i think that's you probably it's like the the highest res right now yeah pretty much. and then it's um an oled screen and then what's cool about the vibe is that it's a volume you know where you can move your head around but you can also walk around a space yeah. which which i think you kind of can do with oculus but maybe not I, i've heard rumors that they've said that you could do something like yeah, it but it, they're similar yeah but it's not as so that's kind of the different and then there's the project orpheus or morpheus which was mm -hmm. the playstation which is the playstation one which is i think uh 400 or 500 but it's mm -hmm. not as high res but um and you need a i think you need a playstation too as yeah, well so, so. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday i think on the on the tonight show they showed uh, uh robert de niro with a with an oculus set on he was like you talking to me you talking to me <laughs> you talking to me no, <laughs> Well, well, I think it's time to look at some some stuff. So, okay. do you want to start off and show yeah, some yeah. slides, and then 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 we'll see your. your do you want to do it all online? Yeah. yeah. I, I, okay. I, I okay. Have, okay. Yeah. Where you can just all tab over to Chrome, and you got it. Let's give me a sec. And... There you go, and it's called New Window. Okay, you're off and running. Okay. Get up here. So. You take the lights down. Okay. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. So I have two, I'll show you guys. So there's one um, at 
so this is two proposals. Um, one is um, let's do um, one is the lack my toilet retrospective, and then the other one is um, I'll just kind of intro. So this one is basically uh, an experimental film um, that I did in Spain with um, George Orwell, where I I it's basically follows his trajectory through um, his book Homage to Catalonia. Are you guys familiar with this? So you guys know where George Orwell is, right? 1984. So he fought in the Spanish Civil War, and, um, and he writes about it really poetically in that book. Um, and I went over there, and I found the bunker he was at. And during that time, it hailed. And so I have this really weird kind of experimental video that kind of um, it hails, and then I go and around the bunker, and it's like this bunker that it's the original bunker, and then they built a bunker on top of it that looks like the original. So it's this weird kind of meta thing going on. Anyway, so what I was going to do with this proposal is basically insert like the this kind of um, CG um, melting um, ice sculpture thing into the gallery. Um, and so I did some tests. Um, you know, here's my front porch. So this is basically kind of like classic visual effects um, kind of stuff. So this is it's the test. It's not that good, but you can kind of see what's going on. So like insert in this into the space. So you could actually like put on the headset and look around it. And this is another conversation you could have. It's like, how do you talk about VR um, outside of having the headset, you know? So this is one way I've kind of been able to do it, right? And so this is kind of what it would look like in the gallery where people would be, um, obviously the, the, the mannequins are would be people and they would put it on the headset and then they would see the space and then you would have the object into it added into it too but there's other things i would do and i'll, I'll turn this down but um andy what's, what's in the actual space just so the actual space would be this right so you go and you would see the film right which is like the hail it hails and all this it's like five minutes long and then orwell talks over it and then instead of the plinth well you'd have the plinth and then you would have the oculus or the vibe on top of it and you would put your headset on and then you would see um, instead you would see let me see if I can find a frame okay it's like me talking for a bit okay and then you would see that right and then but you could also do things where you take the entire walls away right and then and then what I think is also interesting is having a hinge between and this is where I kind of with the Lachman thing it's like you could go where you have this hinge between reality and virtual reality, right? So you have two things that match the two spaces and you could touch one. And so I think there's something about that that I think people like to be able to kind of situate themselves where they don't get sick. But so anyway, so that's the Orwell idea. And then I have this other one, which is more, um, this is cooler or it's, it's different, um, called the LACMA one, which is a couple minutes long. So I thought we could play it here. Is there a volume control? Yeah, there is. It should be fine, I think. Okay. I'm going to try it. If not, I'll come up there. The lack of toilet retrospective. You got more? Yeah, you got it. The of four of these bathrooms from the lack of campus and reprojection of these bathrooms using photogrammetry into virtual reality. Each viewer will be asked to don a virtual reality headset and be placed inside a large plexiglass box where they will be able to experience the reprojected version and even touch and feel these different pieces within the space. Viewers uh, who are not in the VR experience will be able to watch from afar, and thus this being a huge part of the experience is how the viewer um, and the viewers outside um, experience it together. Here we have um, one of the viewers getting closer to the objects on the outside, what we'll be seeing, and then the person inside, what they will be seeing through the virtual reality headset. As you can see, the match should be exact and one-to-one. -one. Once done, the viewer will have a map which will allow them to find the specific bathroom they, they were just within on the LACMA campus, and then walk uh, through the campus to find that space itself. And this is a large part of the project as well, where we're exploring how um, the relationship with the per between virtual spaces and real life spaces and how that changes our perception of the space 
um, in both space, in both worlds. So as one um, experiences a virtual version of reality, does that make the space that it was digitized from special, or does it make the virtual one better than the, the original? So here we can see the viewer is um, trying to find the specific space, and um, we could actually have um, different um, you know, signs and stuff like that that will make it easier to find them. And this is also exploring the idea of male versus female bathrooms and the idea of the bathroom as a specific kind of space of um, privacy or um, fear or of imagination. So you can see the, the, the viewers now found the bathroom which um, they were in earlier and they're seeing how the different um, different bathroom elements are matching up between the two worlds and how um, the lighting values might change between these different um, spaces as well. Technologically, I've been using um, Presence, which is a point-based virtual reality um, experience basically using a full-on production render to create points which you can then explore in 3d here um, presence is now allow you to use a room scale space um, to explore and allowing you to do that will um, of course allow us to walk within a larger volume basically the size of the bathroom here you can see how presence allows you to move your head around even though you're using a full-on rendered image rather than a video game engine. So this is basically the, the cutting edge right now that we have access to, that I have access to. Um, and I've been working with them for quite a while um, on their beta uh, version and now I would like to um, continue to use it on this project. With that being said, there are other virtual reality um, tools which I think are worth exploring and particularly if um, I'm able to get access to um, through the LACMA initiative, perhaps um, Lightfield's, um, particularly the Otoy um, render, Octane renders um, ability to render Lightfields and also the Lytro's Emerge um, render, or excuse me, yeah, Lytro's Emerge camera. These both allow you to capture Lightfields which are really um, probably the most uh, beautiful VR rendered elements. However, the technology is really in its infancy, and also getting access to it is really problematic. Um, so while there are other people doing uh, exploring this tech, um, NVIDIA and Stanford in particular, but there are, so there are other people doing like those, but it's something which um, for right now I think presence might be a better fit. And of course, it's using the same tools um, which I use in production. So for example, here I'm rendering all, all these objects which um, I'm using for this demo using Solid Angle's Arnold render, which is you know used on Gravity and Pacific Rim and all these big budget movies, and it allows me to get to a fidelity that is really you know, can't get to with a video game engine, which is historically what you would do with a virtual reality headset. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is match reality and try and create this hinge between the two, and I think these tools allow us to finally do that. I hope you like it. So. Um... Anyway, so that's what I've been up to. And the other big thing um, I think is I've been I was thinking about adapting this project to doing a project in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Mississippi to kind of capture their governor's bathrooms. So <laughs> anyway, so that's so that's what I'm up to. Uh, do you guys want to talk about it or we could have Eric go or um well why don't we have Eric's stuff and then we'll do like a general QA. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Okay, well, I could uh, I could show you a few things. Probably what I'll do is uh, I'll give you this really basic intro demo. So this was a conference that I went to a few weeks ago called Immersa, which is a really great organization I've been involved with for a while that uh, is the full dome community. But now that things are going VR, you know, the there's a call to action to kind of expand into uh, to VR. So this was uh, just kind of an intro because a lot of the full dome community may not be aware of the, the revolution that's at hand here. Um, this was just my background, uh, different things that uh, kind of the type of work that I do. Um, my side studio, we do a lot of work that uh, involves natural history and cultural heritage and science and so forth. 
Um, and VR is great for what for my background for being a uh, environments artist from features. Um, so this is just talking about. I'm not going to go through this at length, but just saying this is quite a quite an interesting moment of uh, this unprecedented uh, kind of uh, explosion of VR interest that's happening. So it's really immersion going mainstream, and the the full dome community has always been true believers, but it's been a, a small subculture. And LA definitely is a flashpoint in all this. Um, there's just so much uh, speculation, studio involvement now. Uh, there's mark ubiquitous markers everywhere about a VR LA is just a phenomenal uh, meetup that happens. It's now going to be in the West Hall of the LA Convention Center in August. And I think they're expecting 6,000. That was started by a 19-year-old student uh, from here that started it, and it uh, took off. He uh, formed a company with some guys. He dropped out of our program, and now he's riding high as the, you know, one of the big uh, movers and shakers in VR. It's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we have this uh, VRSC. Actually, I misspelled that um, group, which is just tremendously successful here on campus. And they had a huge event here yesterday. Um, and like I say, this is a big year, so it's a proliferation of the headsets. The New York Times shipped about uh, 3 million cardboard headsets, as Andy talked about. Um, Samsung headsets are a good way to, to, to uh, look at work, too. And it's also the work that some of the content's getting mature as well. Sundance has embraced it, as uh, Andy pointed out. South By, apparently, this year was huge in, with VR. Um, this is just an example of some of the meetup culture that's that's exploded. This is VR LA um, in, in different events. I've been going to it from the beginning, and it's just uh, it's amazing to witness the growth in this thing. And great panel discussions, all kinds of here's a flying you know simulator there, all all types of immersive uh, uh, thing. But just but just to witness the the explosion of public interest is phenomenal. The other interesting thing is it's kind of youth culture. Um, coupled with, uh, you know, dare I say it, the graying film community. Um, I, you know, I, I saw a presentation once by this 19-year-old and a few of his cohorts, and they, you know, had probably not been on stage a whole lot. And they were, and this, the audience, I was in the back of the audience, and it was half kind of youth and half kind of gray hair from the film industry and veterans and, uh, you know, who are wondering what, what's going on here. And uh, one of uh, uh, Cosmo's uh, friends got the mic and he said, you know, and he had it took this real kind of assuming posture. And he said, you know, I've been doing VR now for two years and all the gray heads I could see in the audience was kind of like Ugh, shaking and agitation, you know, but uh, but that's what's happening. It's an interesting cultural thing. It's a generational thing. It's a techno technological thing um, and a creative thing. It's just uh, it's I've never seen anything like this. It's really something else. So for this presentation, I just did a Google search on VR meetups and I was pretty stunned. These are just some of the images I found. I mean, Akron, Ohio has a VR meetup. That's pretty wild. Madison, Wisconsin, Tokyo, of course, uh, Asia, Pacific. Um, everywhere, Mexico. It's just, it's, this is like a global thing that's happening. It's just unbelievable. Um, and of course, VRLA is still kind of the dominant one, but, you know, but still, it's, it's, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, and then, as I say, this is the year of content. Also, Felix and Paul is, uh, they're really the consummate uh, creators at this moment. We're actually partnering with them on some things, and they're just really, really great, great filmmakers. Uh, they have a film background and they learned a lot about uh, ortho stereo, which is very correct perceptual stereo. And then as VR took off, they kind of translated those skills into doing VR. So they've done a lot of work with Cirque du Soleil. And uh, now they've gotten funding from Facebook and are doing all kinds of uh, fantastic projects. But they have a keen interest in doing kind of meaningful VR as opposed to kind of, you know, too much pop culture. Um, but that being said, there's also a lot of great VR journalism that's going on with Verseworks, Chris Milk's work. He's kind of kickstarted this whole VR journalism of, uh, you know, the empathy tag and so forth of putting yourself in the place of a Syrian refugee or so forth. So there's a ton of really powerful work that's coming out there. Story Studio, they were here yesterday. They're an offshoot of Pixar, basically um, uh, Oculus kind of rated Pixar of some key members, and they formed their own studio, Story Studio, to develop uh, animation work, but more on the real-time side. But uh, And we're all waiting to see this content. They've been doing it, uh, developing it now for a year and a half or more and never been released. So I think now that the Oculus is uh, uh, coming out, I think they will probably ship it with that. 
and then we're uh, myself. I'm working with John a lot. They're they're becoming trying to be a big uh, studio unto themselves to aggregate content, distribute content, and fund content. And then uh, there's this huge proliferation of cameras. This is the Ricoh. Actually, that's the LG, but the uh, that's the Ricoh Theta that I talked about, the $300 uh, uh, device so you can get started. Most all of these cameras are just woefully flawed in some way or another uh, because you can't separate sensors on a camera and expect it to uh, successfully stitch. So, but different people have done different things about it. Um, the John camera, you can see that over there. It's a really kind of space age looking one. It was actually on set on a Star Wars uh, shot and JJ Abrams said, leave it in there. So it's actually in the new Star Wars. I haven't found what shot it is. And then Samsung is coming out with a great little device over in the far right, which is uh, uh, will handshake with the gear, which would be kind of nice. But people are, and we do this in my company. My business partner is very technical, and he designs different kind of array cameras for different productions. Um, so that's going on, too. And then headsets, the again, the big, what it's narrowed down to, there's all kinds of uh, devices for your phone, but these are the primary ones, which is the Vive up here, which is the, the probably the highest performance, followed closely by the Oculus release. And then I'm a big fan of the Samsung device, which again is not for real time, but it's more for cinematic work and uh, uses your own phone. Of course, you know, uh, when I demo that, people get my texts that come through. So it's kind of a problem actually, but they, but it, it's a very, I mean, I take this everywhere I go and in restaurants, we have business meetings. I'll just break it out and I'll show somebody the real right there in a restaurant. It's fantastic. I mean, it's just, and it's super high quality. It's the highest resolution out there. Uh, and I'll be happy to demo that for you if you want to see it. And then on the end is Google Cardboard, which is a whole genre of, of uh, viewers that'll work with an iPhone. Uh, the big question is when will Apple drop in on this party and, uh, you know, take no prisoners. We don't know. Uh, maybe it'll be this year, but, you know, they're pretty good at secrecy. We do know that uh, based on patents and job openings, kind of what they're up to. And it's going to be more on the AR side, but they may, you know, I'm surprised they're waiting this long to get involved. But that's going to be another thing that'll really uh, broaden it, make it go much larger. Uh, I'm not going to go into these in detail, but just to kind of show you all the graphs are going upward, um, whether it's investment, whether it's uh, HMDs, whether it's, uh, yeah, revenues. Um, so all this is happening. Uh, this is the graph, and I forget the name of it, that's used in Silicon Valley a lot to talk about, like, tech trigger and then ex inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and plateau. And VR is, I guess, I would put it somewhere around here. I went to a presentation last summer in Silicon Valley, and they were saying it was down kind of more in the lower part of that. But I think we're probably around there now. So I think it really is kind of expanding, and it's gotten through the rougher periods. Um, this will go through pretty quick. This is kind of more for the full dome community. Like, do you, how are you going to respond to this? And you could kind of, maybe the question should be posed for this, this audience too, is as an educator, uh, do you want to disregard this or do you want to participate in it? Do you want to evade or participate? And do you see this as friend or foe um, or drunken uncle, like I say? Um, but um, yeah, so this is kind of just questions I was raising to Immersa. Um, but as creators, again, I kind of talked about this. How are you going to support yourself for the next few years? Um, the ultimate end game of building your own audience. Um, let's see. Yeah, and it's just got great, great potential, I think, to, uh, to really, it's so compelling. And then, of course, from a human level, so societal level, you know, it is super, super isolating, um, which I'm not real fond about. I mean, I'm kind of dreading the moment my daughters have their own headsets. But, um, but you know, it is going to become increasingly social. Uh, Facebook will see to that and others. The first step now is to get your body back into it. That's happening. The next step is to get others in the same space that's happening. All this is beginning. So five years from now, it'll be a whole different scene. And at some point, the big bulky headset will go away. And I think uh, it was speculated a few days ago, you know, Palmer Lucky is saying it'll probably just be a pair of Ray-Bans at some point. Um, and then this is just a slide to say that, you know, that I think there's great, great potential in this of just making really profound, uh, you know, content for it. Um, and this is just kind of some little online memes I found. This means nothing to you, but it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of experts out there that really don't know kind of what they're talking about. 
but uh, but anyway, that's just a real quick little prezzo. And then um, maybe I'll just finish on a few slides here. I'm going to run through these, though. And this will tell you about what we're doing here. So this is that class with the three components, um, IMAX and so forth. This is kind of my background. Some of the films that I was on developing these big cityscapes for, Castaway, which actually that's just up the road in Malibu. It's not in Fiji. Sorry to disappoint. Uh, but this is the new class that, uh, that we're doing now. And again, I don't need to go too deep into this. I kind of described it already. Um, but again, it's more as exercises, but um, we're getting some, some pretty polished work. One big thing that I do that Andy talked about is I, I teach them panoramas because it's a, it, number one, it gets them back into nature, which is a good thing, and uh, gets them outside of LA. We have a lot of international students, so it's really good for them to know that the United States is more than you know downtown Los Angeles. And uh, so I take them out here and we do a, a camp out and uh, show them all about photography and how to interpret the natural world. We do light painting at night. These are some light painting exercises that we do. And we shoot these in stereo. So we have them in full 3D, which is really fun. And uh, this is just some slides on talking about what immersion is. It's nothing new. These are some technical things. This is a UCSB, which is the Allosphere, really great uh, immersive sphere up there. Uh, but this is the three that we use in the class. Um, that's the new IMAX screen that we have, and then a little bit of full dome and a lot of VR. And then, uh, you know, I talk about the benefits of having two eyes or the disadvantage of having two eyes, I should say. It's a lot easier, you know, when you just have one. Um, and then uh, this is kind of the rudiments of panoramic shooting. So we teach them that. And this is some of the work that I do, uh, very high resolution work and have done over the years in my own things. This is kind of, this is the latitude longitude format, the flattened image. And if you map it onto a sphere in Maya, then you can recompose. Um, and you can, uh, this, these are the tricks that I do. I take landscape uh, train data and I integrate it so that I can get uh, dimensionality and interactivity on the scenes. Um, do that with time-lapse. Uh, we use fisheye lenses a lot of times for dome work and that. Show them how to shoot HDRs. Uh, how to integrate CG objects into the panorama. And of course, this could this is just, you know, a, a section of what would be in VR. And then I also teach them photogrammetry. This is taking witness photography or just really a survey of photographs. And then from that, reconstructing 3D environments or objects um, that you can get incredible fidelity on. And this is now pretty easy to do. It's very, you know, it has the, what I call the grandmother uh, rule, which is, is it easy enough for your grandmother to do? And I think pretty much this is now. It's pretty crazy. And this is a short that I put together. Maybe I'll just show this. It's like a minute long. Um, showing what you can do with photogrammetry. Um, let me find the page. Uh, here we are. So this is uh, some photogrammetric capture of uh, tufas that I think you just saw, which are about two feet uh, things at Mono Lake. And then this is, whoops, sorry. I don't have much of a mouse here. And oh, actually, sorry, let me go here. There we go. So here I'm trying to play with scale. You can see I brought in some scale figures and atmosphere to kind of convey a different uh, type of scene. And again, integration of CG objects uh, that receive the same light because we're shooting an HDR at the same time. And here the CG object is receiving light and also casting shadow um, onto the photogrammetric model. And then we're shooting a uh, spherical HDR time-lapse at the same time. So that's lighting some of the CG accoutrements that I put in here. And we were lucky to have the lovely Sierra wave happening over the Eastern uh, Sierra that day. Okay, so that's uh, 
that's some of the, so these are the technique. In other words, the reason I, I show this is this is what I do in my own practice, but I, I uh, basically show the students how to do this. A lot of it is very approachable. I'm just going to race through the rest of this. This is kind of looking at full dome work. This is some work that I did for the Griffith. Um, and then, uh, whoops, sorry, let me, sorry about this. This is moving on to the next. Okay, and then this is some of the different dome work uh, uh, collaborations I made with a, an artist named Charles Lindsay, where we did a lot of scanning different natural elements and put that together and cutaways of some of the the uh, things at, at uh, Yellowstone. So just different full dome techniques, and then we move the class into VR, and then at that point uh, we talk about what's been done here at, at SC, and then uh, all the kind of things that I talked to you about a few minutes ago. And then, uh, as I say, you know, future is waiting to be invented, and who better than to create it than you as a student? And then uh, this is some work we did uh, last year with Bjork, uh, doing photogrammetry and some of these techniques. So a lot of this is shown to the students and, and said, uh, you know, we're doing the very same things that we've done on these other professional projects. This is laser scans and photogrammetry we did for a MoMA installation that Bjork had last year. Uh, scanning these caves and different natural elements. It was a theater at, at MoMA, New York. And then we also had the pleasure of working with Ai Weiwei last year um, on a project with a uh, collaboration with him and the Navajo Nation. So we went and made a, uh, were uh, commissioned to do a dome film about this collaboration. And it was a, uh, a piece of land art, uh, singular uh, night event uh, with this fire uh, kind of event. You could see Weiwei's uh, piece next to it, which was actually ground porcelain from the pots that he's uh, uh, famously broken, which is kind of sits in the New Mexico desert now. And uh, this was a frame of the dome film. And this was all photogrammetry that we did flying a drone and kind of reconstructing the event for VR also. So we had an in interactive installation of it and uh, a dome presentation, of course. And then lastly, uh, what I'm working on now is a whole series of kind of travel-based titles. And this is uh, for VR. So this is capturing panoramas, but building 3D geometry. Here we're showing, uh, talking about what, what's happened up at, at Everest Space Camp. And this is a work in progress I have, which is kind of a sampling of nature that's being reassembled and into these interesting areas. And uh, so this is what I'm working with John on, is to develop uh, different travel titles at the moment. So anyway, so that's that's kind of what I do and then how uh, how we apply it to uh, some of the student work here. All right, so Tom, you want to bring the lights up, I guess? Okie dokie. Great. Well, thank you guys. Thank the both of you. Let's get a little hand for them. So I thought it's interesting too, uh, just piggybacking on the, uh, on the John workshop that the workshop that's being set up here at, at USC, when they when they were picking faculty for it, John specifically asked, "We don't want tech people. We want creative." Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's like we've got tech and everything, but we need creative to start to put together, you know, you know, basically, you know, what we're going to be doing narrative-wise. So, so uh, at this point, I'd like to throw it open to questions. Now, um, when you ask a question. Uh, um, please uh, uh, identify yourself and also uh, what university, whatever that uh, you know you're part of. So, what's that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, 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 yeah, we'll run around like Phil Donahue or something. Let it do that. <laughs> okay. Anybody got questions? No. Anybody else? Okay. Um, thanks, guys. Um, that was amazing and eye-opening. I'm Aubrey Mintz, uh, head of animation at Cal State Long Beach. It's a, um, Steven Spielberg's old school. Yeah, that's right. The <laughs> famous dropout school. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just curious about, you know, th as an educator, thinking about how to start thinking about incorporating this into the classroom. I mean, there's so many areas, obviously, you can go with VR. What are some of the things you... What are some of the goals in your class? Like by the end of the semester, what do you hope them to be kind of armed with as a understanding VR? Yeah, well, okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, the class that I described to you, what um, number one, the thing is we, we offer no prereqs for it. A lot of time, I, what I do here in the program is I teach a lot of the Maya curriculum and a lot of visual effects techniques. 
So I'm kind of giving them more technical expertise uh, to try to aid them in their thesis work or what have you. But um, but in this case, we uh, so we have different prerequisites to advance to go up in inter intermediate classes. This class, we specifically had no prereqs because we're trying to meet the demand from interest from production, engineering, all the different schools here on campus. That's the other interesting thing about VR is that it crosses all boundaries. It's really animation is a great domain for it, but it, it really there's such vast interest in it. Um, so without the prereqs, I can't, that's why I've called it, um, experiments and immersion. It can't be more than, I mean, it can't be complete films. I did charge them, uh, on the VR component, which is what we're in the middle of right now or toward the end of, and, uh, with giving me a narrative and asking me to give me a moment of a narrative. So the narrative they've given me are actually terrific. There's been a great collection of really fascinating pieces, which would be great if it was a directed study or a full studio course. So I came in after I got all these and I said, okay, the good news is it's a terrific collection of ideas. The bad news is you can't do any of it. I said, you can give me one moment from it. That's all we really have time for. And you don't have the expertise anyway yet, technically. So I'm kind of bearing the weight of that, doing the heavy lifting at the end to try to get them through the Maya section of it that they may be, you know, new to. Um, so that's so. In other words, I'm trying to show them higher level production techniques, but for me as an educator, I have to kind of take that burden at the end. So it is a little tough, I do have to say. But that, but I'd rather do that and see get something more significant from it. And uh, you know, when we when you look at the work on the headset here, hopefully you will, you'll see that that same process, which is they're trying to reach a little higher. I have to come in and support them uh, on it. But I, I think it's a good technique. It just kind of puts a, a bit of a load on me at this moment. But the, uh, the the other approach, of course, could be using something like the Theta. And the John camera is pretty turnkey. It's another grandmother capable device, to be honest. So um, we're hoping that that's going to work for production, for film production, to be able to let them, you know, rel to do VR shooting, 360 shooting, relatively trivially um, compared to what it takes as an animator of having to create the whole scene. So um, I want to take your class. That sounds really cool. How, is it expensive to... to <laughs> Oh boy, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Such is so at Fullerton, as you probably know at Cal State, we're we're really impacted. So it's been difficult to spin up a new class just for VR. So what I've been doing is giving it as an optional uh, to a, a special topics class we have. So there's advanced 3D kids, about as advanced as we get, and then um, give them uh, a basically kind of like a, an option to follow VR if they want to go in that direction. Um, but there's a lot of um, issues right now with the way our labs are set up and trying to get the technology in and all that stuff. So we're kind of ramping up to it. But I would suggest, like, I think what, what um, Eric's talking about sounds brilliant in a sense where it's open to anybody to come and access um, from any of the areas of the campus because it creates this kind of almost like this utopian art space um, where you have all this kind of great collaboration, which is really what VR is. You know, it's like visual effects and so it's a, all these different spaces coming together. Um, and then it does, I think, I think the problem being is the professor ends up being the kind of the engineer of it all, you know, and I can imagine it being a lot of extra work, which we are already doing a lot of extra work anyway, so. Uh, uh, I have a question I was thinking too of, um, I noticed like in, in some workshops, there's always a number of people from the screenwriting department that are fascinated by this, you know, they want to get involved. And I was thinking like, what, how, how do you personally see like a potential uh, script or, or or narrative. Yeah, it's so interesting. I was so my brother is a Chris Vidak is a screenwriter, and uh, he had a show called Chuck, um, and he writes um, for uh, Days uh, Legends of Tomorrow right now. And I had dinner with him last night, and he 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 won't stop talking to me about this stuff. He thinks it's the coolest stuff, and he keeps on giving me ideas for me to do. That they're his ideas, you know. And but they, it's I think it really is from a narrative perspective. Writers get really excited about it, you know. I think they're really into it, um, and particularly like he he just had an idea where it's like, you know, it would be like a, the set of after like a murder, right? And then you would be you would be on the set and you could 
experience it from different locations from like the dead bodies perspective from the perspective of like the helicopter flying above from the perspective of the um, you know and then you would tell a story through that you know so i think there's a lot of possibilities there that you could really explore you know and i think um for me that kind of gets me excited to just have that kind of conversation but i don't know if you've had any um experiences with screenwriting or anything you want to talk about that no we we have not yet but i'm you know no but i but i am aware that writers find it you know of great interest yeah. so we're waiting waiting for that cool so an, another question and and are we uh, um, patrick are we able to take questions from from the virtual world out there Oh, okay. <laughs> we are able. Okay, if somebody asks us something. <laughs> right. The world can ask questions, whatever you want. So, any any other questions from in here? Tom, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. My name is uh, Thomas Ako. I'm not affiliated with the university yet, but uh, hopefully soon. Um, I'm curious about application of this stuff. Now, obviously, it's in experimental stages, and the art installation stuff looks amazing. And I can see industrial done that way. It seems to lend itself toward gaming more than anything because of the first person immersive aspect of it. Um, you mentioned was a PlayStation might have was a PlayStation that has a yeah the PlayStation with the Morpheus. They've already kind yeah. Of um, are they getting involved with, because I know there's gaming engines that uh, are right. being programmed and using VR in the experimental stages now, but uh, yeah. Oh, well, I, I, okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Mean, I think game, game engines were the first to really to be um, attracted to VR. I mean, in this interactive way, because they're inherently built real time. Right, so you don't have to. You, you can move your head around immediately, right? Right. And so, but I think for me, I, I wonder if that's the long term. What you'll see is kids playing games all day, you know, because it's it's somewhat. I think how long you can put the goggles on and experience it. Yeah. Some people can do for a long time. Some people can't. So I wonder if there's like a different space than games that we might see, which is like the art installation or. I think Home Depot has, or I forget what, like you're, you're seeing these kind of um, in between, like looking at an object or looking at your um, clothing you want to try out, that kind of stuff. That right. might be a space. Yeah. Um, so that is you're starting to see immediately. Um, and then I think augmented is really where I think Facebook's going, you know, where, and Google, because that's where you, and I think there was um, a recent talk that, um, the Facebook guy did where he talked about, you know, their trajectory. And if you look at their map, you know, AR is there, you know, and then he even had an anecdote of, you know, what if you wanted a big screen TV in your, your apartment, you could spend a, spend a dollar and you immediately would have a big screen TV. Right. So there, there, and, and once you commodify that, you know, you commodify somebody's consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. then you can insert anything you want into it. Right. And then right. you see like Samsung, um, I think they had a, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but I think um, it was a um, patent on a contact lens, right? So once you do wow. that, you know, so it, to me, that there it's in that that direction, you know. But I think you know, games was really. I, I think games are really cool too. I'm sure there's going to be really cool stuff. I just wonder how much time you can spend in it, you know, and I, the dystopian side of it kind of creeps up on me. But yeah, I no, I. I, I I have the same opinion and, and concerns. I just, I also know they generate a lot of money, maybe even more money than feature films do nowadays. But um, I'm just wondering if they're, how deeply they're involved in the development, not just of the technology, but of the narrative aspect as well. I mean, you've got, I mean, obviously it kind of sources from games, but the, uh, uh, the one interesting thing that I've learned is gamers, hardcore gamers, that culture has not embraced it like, I would have thought, and I was, I'm still rather stunned by this beat. I don't know, for some reason, they, they don't feel like they need it as much. I've talked to several gamers hardcore about this and they, they're like, well, isn't this like your greatest day out ever? And they're like, no, no, we don't, we don't really need that. And we're already immersed and, but it, and the other interesting thing is recently Grand Theft Auto 
has gone over to VR, and now it's seen as very highly disturbing, as if it wasn't already. Yeah, I, you know where exactly. you're shooting pedestrians or whatever. But now, because they're at room size scale, so you feel the scale of the human. You have, and the one thing about talent we haven't really talked about in in uh, in VR is that your relationship to humans changes entirely from film, because in film there's an object objectification of right. a celebrity or a name actor. Whereas when you see that same actor in VR, you have you feel intimate with that person, and you feel like you are a peer rather than you know uh, you know an observer. So as a result of that, when you're in a, a VR world and you're shooting people, it's a it, from what I've read, it's it's been very disturbing for people. So it's now you know this is a great sociological <laughs> yeah, that's study, not a but bad thing. But so but anyway, but that being said, what I will say positively about this whole thing is that um, so we because we're doing a lot of this dev in my company, we're we're going to all these events all the time and demonstrate you know we're demoing our our little two minute reel all the time. And uh, people love it. Um, I think it's a good reel. And people take it off and they go, wow, that was fantastic. And they're all excited and they're smiling. But then they get this 500-yard stare. And I've seen this most of the time. And they kind of, they look up and they go, you know, I could use this for what I do. And I've, I've put this on an 80-year-old, an 8 to an 80-year-old. And the 80-year-old took it off and said, wow, I could play golf again. You know, yeah. and it was yeah. like, wow, okay, wow. yeah, you're right. You know, That's I mean, cool. you can take this to, you know, nursing homes and let them, you know, like I've got a Wright Brothers aircraft simulation. That you, wow. They could fly that, you know. Wow. It's like, so you could really, when you think about it, that's the thing I find so stimulating about this is that you could apply it to any walk of life, any endeavor. I mean, just about anything, anything of human you know, endeavor could be kind of utilized or capitalized. For well, it. like you were saying, is like Lumiere, as, you know, or at that stage yeah. of, of, of filmmaking is it's like with gaming, you know, Mist really took off as a computer mm -hmm. game, and that's actually kind of self, you know, a first person immersive yeah, thing for, right. for today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that really sold a lot of people on games, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. on the computer. And then, of course, the platforms came out with other things. Um, so it's, you know, so it's early days yet. I will, and, I will say this though, there is a common perception, and I, I won't say who it was yesterday, but somebody was kind of um, negating 360 video or cinematic experiences saying, I find it boring because I'm being carried along on a path. You know, it's not my path. And, you know, I love cinema. That's why I'm here. It's like I'm not, I don't want to leave cinema. I'm not a gamer. I'll never have been. Really, I, I did play Miss and Ribbon, you know, just yeah. out of that. But, but the, but the fact is, I'm not in that world. But, but they see what we do in film as being boring. I see real time, in effect, as boring because I do a little interaction. I go, well, what's next? You know, it's like right. I'm just standing there, like, well, okay, you know. I mean, to me, it's not that fascinating. But there is. I'm just raising it that there is a cultural schism between those two sides. You know. Uh, now you're you're dividing you you're you're kind of you know taking you're you're appropriating real time for your purposes right for cinematic and fine art purposes which is how it should be you know but but so I'm kind of talking more about the established norm but there is this kind of weird mindset yeah. that's that's out there yeah, yeah I, th I think too just perception and acceptance has to shift yeah yeah it's which yeah. it has to be developed as you guys are doing yeah. to help that just its existence will help shift that so um, i was just wondering about uh, you know one thing that was brought up when they were talking about potential narratives was remember um uh, those who live in the la area maybe about 20 years ago or something there was a play at the at the at the at the, at the uh, vfw hall in hollywood called tamara and 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 what's interesting was that it was a, it was an immersive play where like instead of a stage you walk through this ho home and every room you went in was a different scene of the play, and then you would walk into the next room. And there'd be another scene, and all. So, so, so you set the the pace and the direction that you were walking in, and each time there'd be a different section of the play being done there. And 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 when people were talking about VR, they were thinking maybe that's something you know that could, that that could be a narrative. You know? Yeah, you could follow different characters to different rooms. Yeah, well, your yeah. group would split up, and then you converge and go hey wait this guy did this and that guy did that yeah you know yeah interesting interesting Harvey, you want to go ahead? Yeah. my follow-up question is pretty simple 
What's Tracy working on in this area? Tracy Fullerton. Oh, don't forget to identify yourself. Uh, I'm at uh, UCLA Extension, but uh, uh, I used to be at USC. So uh, the, I we, think the we, inferred we question, <laughs> the inferred question is like about that kind of um, narrative development sort of on the game side. I wonder what folks like Tracy doing, are doing. It's more, you know, again, it's not my domain, so I'm not as up to speed. Actually, I saw Tracy present yesterday on recent research, but uh, I mean, she's kind of the grand, you know, architect of that program. So is is kind of I don't I don't know of any VR project specific to her line of of research, but um, not to say there's not a ton that goes on there, but uh, but it's in my mind, I think it's valuable within that realm, but. A lot of it to me is not as cinematic. It, it is, and the, the funny thing is, from a real time, I, I don't want to keep doing an S and M thing on real time versus cinematic, but, but, uh, but I think real time culture, um, again, they think their world is cinematic, and they're doing great strides to create that. Right, the Walden game that they've been developing for a while does feel like you're immersed in a cinematic experience, and most gamers will say that. Like what we do is is better than movies. They very frequently will say that. I tend to disagree, but then again, I don't, I'm not immersed in their world as much, but um, I, I'm just terribly fascinated by what this could be as a directed cinematic experience that is a director is showing us his vision and, and directing us as a viewer along the way, much like you are when you experience film. I mean, to me, I, I would like to translate that, explore that in VR. Um, but the real-time mindset is very different. You know, they think of film as a space that I can inhabit and interact with. So it's a different type of approach. But anyway, no, there's there's tremendous work that goes on over there. Yeah. One, um, of, one of the things that's interesting is um, we've been talking, you know, with with our dean here and all about coordination because, you know, when when CG got started, you know, in in the fifties and sixties. Um, it, for a while, it wasn't quite sure where its home was. So, so like there was the mathematics department said we should have the computer, and the science department, the engineering department, the art department, the film department, and it's like where is it? And v VR is kind of like that right now, where it's like uh, the engineering school wants to do some VR, and we're doing VR, and interactive's doing VR, and it's kind of like a, a a flea market. You come in, there's all these little stalls, <laughs> like none of them are talking to one another. So, we've actually been started to to coordinate so we can have like sort of a, a common direction so everybody's not inventing the wheel in their own corner you know yeah, it's another kind of manifestation of, of the mature board to be honest it, it yeah. can be yeah, negatively sure. but positively you know engineering will bring something to the table that we may not have capability for or whatever so i mean in the end but it is another one of these cross school you know divisional uh you know interests that you know i mean i again i've not ever seen media that that draws this interest so strongly from all sides. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, and I, I think just to talk about the narrative, cinematic narrative perspective stuff, I think just because something is um, in an engine, I, I think that the whole idea of the Vive in that space where you can walk around in it could be an interesting um, way to tell narratives where you, as you go around a corner or something like that, you could see something or a narrative would change. Or, um, you know, the whole idea of an edit in virtual reality is a really powerful thing too. And so you could have some of that interactivity within just the way you find the narrative or you're inside of it. And like in the museum show I had at the Cal State LA, there was four plinths and each plinth would, you would go to and then you would see the virtual world, but there was a connecting volume of the actual, um, museum that was always connecting those spaces so in a way that the viewers would be able to um, make their own edits as they kind of went through the, the different areas too so i think there's an interesting kind of overlap there and um there's a really great if you have a chance to check it out there's a video of it um that valve did for it's like a portal version of a vr experience called the it's like the where it's like the the whole portal world and it's like four minutes long and it's with the Vive, and they use, it's kind of like, I think it's kind of like a quasi engine where it's, it looks like they baked in um, like an image base, like a really high-end global illumination render into the textures, and so it looks really good, and then they you move in between these boxes that you can kind of interact with, so you're, you don't actually physically move, and so each time you move, it's a different bake, so it always looks photoreal, um, and it's really brilliant, the story is really hilarious, and so it's a lot of really nice kind of moments that 
both looks really photoreal in a sense that we're, we're used to in visual effects and cinema, but also has its inside of a game engine, which I think is kind of cool. It kind of falls apart when things get start to move. You know, it doesn't look photoreal anymore, but it's a really great narrative that's worth checking out. <laughs> um, Zon, I, I, this is all so fascinating to me, really, and amazing. I, I, I don't even know if I have too many thoughts, but it seem, I, I think, though, when you were saying how it's going to be a few years of playing around, and I think exponential growth is going to be, it's not going to be that long from what I see you showing. I don't think, I think it's going to happen. Like, like that, if, if the Pixar guys are already <laughs> doing narrative, it's to me it seems like like two 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 worlds the the narrative and creative which i would think i would be more interested but it's fa what i'm more fast most fascinated is this this experiential thing like you're saying um, in nursing homes people can travel like if, if you're doing a tour of 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 the bathrooms it's like a it's almost like a, a great equalizer for travel people who who aren't able or couldn't afford to if they, if they really could afford a 300 or 600 dollar and 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 learning you know and instead of um, you know, having to, you know, but you want to learn a language, you go to, the, you're in the place and you can actually hear it be said and be, be, being spoken or learn to cook or who knows, like, like experiencing things or you don't know what you want to do. You get to, to play with that for a while before you, uh, you know, I'll say oh. one really funny thing is that I was pitching ideas to John about different title ideas that I had and the guy, the guy I work with there is a whiskey fan. I knew that because we often sample whiskey together. And so I, I put up a slide at the end just for a chuckle, which was whiskeys of the world. And I had a, this photo of this really cool bar in Scotland or something. And I said, well, we could even do whiskeys of the world, you know. And I, ha, ha, ha. And he's like, that's a great idea. Yeah. You know? well, yeah. Can you, like, will you be able to taste it? And so actually you're doing it. You're doing a microbrewery thing wow. where you're either sent samples and you would say so you would sample something while you know you're guided and well this is where this comes from and now you're in the distillery mm. in Scotland or what have you. Uh, yeah, so I'm, but this is what I'm saying. If you just extrapolate a little bit, it just the whole world opens yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. The, it, we, we, it actually has opened up. Hopefully, it won't just be for billionaires who now can choose what real estate they want to purchase yeah. around the world. They'll yeah. go on tours of the house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just thinking. Have you ever been to the Jack Daniels Distillery in Lynchburg? It's beautiful. It's really it's it's it was like built in like 1866, and it's against a, a gray slate mountain with a natural spring coming out of it. And it's just this beautiful old building and all. So, yeah. Also, I'd, visualization. Cool Athletes, yeah. they always say, or anyone, if they have a, you know, wanted to visualize, this is what better way to visualize, yeah. you know, when people who are handicapped even can climb a, right. a mountain. I, it's amazing. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's definitely something I'm thinking about as an artist too, like with the idea of, like, I plan this summer to go to the state houses. Um, and to, to look at the different bathrooms and scan them to create this kind of virtual version of those bathrooms and then um, have um, a version here where you would experience and you could walk around in. So it becomes like this, you know, what is the idea of, um, you know, the bathrooms of space and, like, who can explore it and, you know, who controls that volume virtually or, you know, in, does the virtual work create a utopian space where we can, we have the power, you know? Um, so I think it's something that's really interesting in that sense. And you can actually think about it, like I was thinking about sneaking into the, to like how could I maybe dress up as the bathroom cleaner and sneak into the bathroom of the governor itself, right? Yeah. And then you have like a whole kind of like Banksy style kind of thing, you know? And I, I do think that's kind of cool. <laughs> we should talk later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, you ever see uh, if you're in Paris, you go to the Gare d'Orsay, the 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 men's room is hysterical, and because uh, it's this Belle Epoque, like it was built in the 1870s, and it's like every every like like you know. Uh, uh, you know, pissoir or whatever like that. It's like it has cascading mermaids and caryatids, and you know, it's all this like sort of like you know, you know, uh, 1870s frou frou. You know, it's, it's like very fun. Inn, right? Oh yeah, like the Madonna Inn. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So. Okay. <laughs> well, I that so that one I that's just I'm not gonna write a grant for it. The LACMA one doesn't have any of the. 
that stuff in it. It's just it's actually I, I wrote the Lack one a couple months ago, um, and then I you know in that in the time that that's happened was you you've had these bills show up in Tennessee, um, uh, North Carolina, and Mississippi, barring um, transgender identifying individuals going into the bathroom that they identify with. Rather, they have to go to their birth bathroom. And so I, I just, to me, it was like, oh, I should, maybe I could plus it in that way and, like, explore it. Because I think it's, like, it, you know, the whole idea of virtual reality and the control of um, reality and, and being able to reproject it in different spaces is really fascinating, you know. And plus I want to kind of give it to them anyway, so it's kind of hilarious. So. What, uh, what are the problems with editing? I'm Harvey Denner. I think um, editing is a huge deal. If you want to, like, it's really easy to get people sick. I, I think a stereoscopic production, you know, that he had, uh, Eric had this great picture of the person going, like, looking both directions at the same time. And, you know, that in itself makes it's easy to get people sick. And so once you start doing virtual reality stuff, where you have people where they can't see their hands and all that kind of stuff, I, I think it becomes really, you have to be really subtle with it. You know, and you have to be really aware. I mean, and even introducing um, elements into the scene where somebody runs into the scene, you'll get that, you know, like that scare factor that's really intense. So it's, I think it's one of those things where you got to be really, it's not like a, a typical film where you're cutting all the time. I think you can cut. I think the cut is very powerful, you know, and it's almost... Uh, something that you have to be really aware of. And also thinking about the space of the room that, or the, the volume that you're working with and then the space that you're going to. And if there's a relationship between the two, that might be really important too. Like in editorial uh, in cinema, you're, you're, when you cut, if you cut to like um, in Mad Max, um, uh, Frank Miller framed everything in the center. So when he cut, your eye wouldn't have to kind of move around, right? So I'm thinking, and this is like, you know, for me, I, I would think about objects in the space, you know, in the volume that when you cut, you have like a, a connection to, so you're not cutting like to this completely different space. Or if you do cut to a completely different space, it, it means something, right? That you're going to be, you know, shocked, right? So I think it's something, it's very new because I've only made a couple of VR films so far, but I think it's something that I think about a lot, you know. I think it's really, actually really fascinating. It's, it seems to me that editing is uh, various types is one way of getting around the real-time thing. I mean, you know, there's a certain boredom that sets in mm. while you're waiting for someone to come on stage. Yeah, it's true. Well, the, the reality is, and this is what I keep trying to bring it back to education because... I think this is a great time for us as educators, too, because we all have our own perception on what these issues might be. And then it's great discussion for students and just to see what comes out of all this. But but the reality is, uh, at least for cinematic VR, um, all the conventions we're used to, it's really the death of a lot of cinematography um, because it's all related to a frame, right, and lensing choices. And there's no lenses in VR. That's the other odd thing. That's so but, but cuts, like what I've found is I, I don't cut any shorter than 15, 20 seconds. That's about the bare minimum. Most of my, my, my shots are like 30 seconds or more. And, um, you know, there's some, Felix and Paul, I think their work is much longer than that. They may have a two-minute cut or something. But but in any case, it's a, yeah, so all the rules of editorial and cinematography really fall away. And for better or worse, you know, I mean, it's kind of sad that, you know, all the, the hundred years of development is kind of now not relevant. But, the, but what I tell the students is this is still all relevant. You're still using light and shadow and, you know, key, you know, principles to direct the eye, but but now there's this further aspect of how do you direct somebody omnidirectionally. Yeah. So well, there's it's this, a whole new thing. It seems inherent that animation is has some advantages over live action when you yeah, do that's video. right. And also sound. Sound is used a lot now for direction. And that's what we haven't developed yet in my teaching, but I'm hoping to integrate at some point is how you direct somebody with that as well. When you look at the pieces um, you'll see many of them are somewhat omnidirectional. Like, I don't think these students explored the act of directing yet, but um, with a few exceptions. Um, but there's, uh, there's just a terrific uh, sense of immersion and kind of animation all around you. And I think you'll enjoy that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's really some terrific stuff. 
Um, and actually, one of the students is right here uh, operating that camera, so you yeah. can enjoy <laughs> Joe's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it, 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 one thing that's going to be interesting too is that you know what we've seen through through cinema history of this sort of cross pollination of one side affecting another because I was thinking about when when television came in at first there was uh, very few movie people involved in television and television kind of formed its own um, uh, um, you know its own vocabulary you know you know for shooting and everything you know how to shoot TV series and such and then people who had come up uh, l learning television started to move into movies like Spielberg did television first and you know a few of the other directors Sam Fuller or whatever and and you know and then now we also had the experience of people who were doing interactive games doing f doing theatrical and theatrical people doing interactive so it'll be interesting to see how VR is going to affect the medium and the medium is going to affect VR so. well, another funny story is uh, and going back to the real time thing, the the beauty of real time compared to cinematic is there's a super high, <coughs> excuse me, uh, sense of presence that's always talked about. Um, that is it is very real. It's like all the you know you may feel some pretty nice immersion from what you'll see on this reel, but when you really see it in real time, it just all 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 the more acute as far as your sense of really being somewhere. And there was uh, when we first saw this about a year ago at a Oculus conference. They had a demonstration of a uh, small alien creature who's about four feet tall and speaking at you and following your eye line. And it was when I cut to that that particular demo, I was pretty stunned. Like, wow, this is real. I mean, I really feel like I'm, you know, uh, interacting with this alien guy. And it was a totally animated character. Um, and I just, I, I just had a big smile on my face when I was walking around, looking and getting right down in front of his face, you know. And uh, my business partner said that when he saw that demo, he said he in subconsciously and instinctively said hello to it. And he said that's the first time he's ever said hello to content before, <laughs> you know. So, And that, again, from an animation standpoint, I mean, it just brings all new realms into what we're going to be doing, you know. Mm -hmm. so, is there any other questions? We good? I think we'll maybe take this afternoon's program and introduce it now just yeah. because um, we have time before our food arrives. Yeah, yeah. If that's then, okay, so why don't we wrap this up and then we'll do some announcements. Right. So, so I figure what we'll do is that, yeah, what, you know, we'll introduce the afternoon program and then also for the remaining time too, you, you know, uh, the people in the room here could could experience some of your demo yeah, and it, we'll, we'll see that. Yeah, and it, and yeah. yeah. For a while, yeah. Like a uh, yeah. Aubrey, do you want to? You want to introduce? We, yeah. Why don't we do some uh, um, announcements first, if that's okay, right. while we have okay. the uh, cameras going and, okay. and the attention of the audience, and then we yeah. can get into the demos. Yeah. Why don't you come up and do it? Hi, guys. Um, I'm Aubrey Mintz. I'm the uh, chair of uh, uh, the Animation Educators Forum. Um, just to give a little bit more information, we meet um, yearly in the general membership, which you guys are all here for. Um, but we also meet at CTN every year in November, and as well, uh, we have a Birds of a Feather at SIGGRAPH. So um, thank you for spending your Saturday with us, and um, keep doing it. Um, we won't do it every Saturday, but um, every event, join us. Um, because like today, we have um, all different types of discussions, and it's nice to know what um, other people are doing in the classroom. So... Um, I just want to first uh, thank our guest speakers um, very much uh, for giving us the insight on VR and thank Tom Cito for moderating. Um, I have to thank um, the other steering committee members. Um, Harvey Denneroff uh, is over here. He's the co-chair. Um, uh, Lee Crow's back there. Uh, all the things you ingest today is from, from her uh, bringing it to campus. I mean food-wise, just so you know that. Um, back there, these tech people. Uh, Patrick Dupree, he's at the back. He's He's been working probably, well, for several months now, but since 7 this morning, organizing all this stuff at the back just so the world outside of this room can um, be a part of it as well. Thank you, Patrick. It's been amazing. And um, Mark Farquhar, he's in the yes. back corner. Also the original helping. evil lord. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, 
Um, so um, we asked ahead of time for some announcements from the education community, uh, which I'll read today. Um, you guys are the first to hear these, so feel honored. Um, there are some scholarships which are really excited, um, really excited about, um, and as well as some events coming up. So the first um, we're going to announce is the um, second annual um, Asifa Hollywood uh, Animation Educators Forum a Student Scholarship Program. So last year we unveiled it with $30,000 of scholarships for students, and this year we are doing not just $30,000, but $34,500. Thank you to Asifa Hollywood. Um, so um, it's opening um, April 23rd, so please tell all of your students. Um, they can apply for a $2,500 uh, scholarship and all the way up to a $5,000 scholarship. So get them thinking. It's a merit-based scholarship, so if you have particular students that you would love to see um, be awarded for their work, help finish their films, and it can be um, undergraduate or graduate students. And if you go to U USC, you could use a scholarship. Right? Yes, you could. <laughs> Or any school. Yes. Tom. That's right. Jeez. <laughs> we're not going to favor one school that's, just because we're that's here. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, so um, look at the ASIFA email blast. If you don't, if you don't get those, you can go to um, um, our webpage, scholarships.animationeducatorsforum.org. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact Dory, uh, dot Littell Herrick, L I T T E L L dash. H E R R I C K at woodbury.edu for any questions. And um, because um, we spent a lot of time giving to students, we thought um, it's also important to award educators. So this year, for the first time, we're doing a faculty grant uh, through a CIFA Hollywood's Animation Educators Forum. So, all you faculty that um, need money, which is probably all of you, um, um, that would like uh, to apply for, say, a travel grant to a conference, um, money for an, uh, a creative endeavor, um, please check it out. It will The information will be coming out probably in May or June, and the um, scholarship application will start um, sometime in um, September or October. So um, keep your eye out for at, at the ASIFA Hollywood Blasts, and we'll have about... I think fifty-five hundred dollars to give out to faculty for this year. That's a you could travel to a lot of famous bathrooms. Down you like could, this. yes. In reality, not just virtual reality. It's getting worse, Tom. It's getting worse. <laughs> okay, uh, we will not be taking this show on the road. That's right. That's okay. Right. Um, okay. The next is from Mark Jones, chair of School of Creative Arts and Animation at Seneca College. Um, this is for the filmmaker, uh, filmmakers out there that are educators. Um, it's an annual summer program where they have animation directors or professors can apply to tr come to Toronto and work on a short film project they wish to produce. Um, I can't talk highly about this enough. I did this last summer and I'm doing it this summer. It's a wonderful program. They have great students and um, you need to find your own uh, travel funding to get down there. Um, but once you're there, you um, Seneca provides an entire crew of students to work on your short film, and they get paid. So it's um, fantastic. Um, films that have been produced there, um, such as Chris Landreth's films, Ryan, The Spine, and Subconscious Password, were all produced part of this program, and um, um, drawn from life from the National Film Board. Um, so you can um, also... Contact mark.jones at senecacollege.ca um, to inquire about that. Um, they usually take applications in January um, for the next summer. Next is the 24-hour animation contest for students, um, as if we don't punish our students enough. Um, somehow they like this. Um, this is something I have been running uh, for about 14 years now. And it's doubled in size every year. We now, uh, last year, we had about 525 students participate from all over the world, really, uh, Australia, Canada, and the U.S. Um, and so, what it is is in it's in the uh, first weekend of October. I announce a theme on uh, Friday at 5 p.m. and um, students have 24 hours in teams of five to make a 30-second animated film um, from scratch to complete finish which sounds impossible, but they all finish their films somehow. 
they actually do more work in the 24 hours than the whole semester, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it's a it's a great event. Um, there's sponsors such as um, Disney, DreamWorks, Toon Boom, CSU Summer Arts, Focal Press, Digicel, Wacom, CTNX, Asifa Hollywood, Stuart Ng Books, DreamWorks, um, Blue Sky, Leica, and Stars last year. So there's great prizes for the students. Um, and it teaches them how to work in teams. So um, they can look, go to the, our Facebook page, just 24 hours, the Facebook page, or they can email me, aubrey.mint um, at csulb.edu. Join us. Okay, next is uh, the World Animation Celebration and Animation uh, Libation Studios. Um, if you would remember, this was a, uh, a grand, incredible um, uh, film festival, big celebration in animation several years ago, and it's been restarted by Animation uh, Libation Studios. Um, it, it will be held at Sony Pictures this year. Um, animated films from all over the world are presented and awarded with an emphasis on student films, so get your students to submit, please. Uh, there are interesting panels such as how to produce a feature and a small selection of booths representing artists and schools. Um, why should people go? Well, um, World Animation Celebration was a popular yearly animated film festival during the second golden age of the 1990s, and its return has been well received. Um, but now it is a film festival rather than a convention, and it focuses only on animation. Attendees come from all over the world, such uh, as far as far away as China. Uh, the booths, portfolio reviews, and social events are held in a lovely, uncrowded outdoor courtyard garden, so students and working animators have easy access to conversations with their favorite artists in the field. Um, it's a low cost compared to other local animation-related events. Prices for 2016 have not yet been set, but the Tickets were $10 for a day last year. Uh, general mission um, as well. Students have uh, opportunities to volunteer. Uh, it's a great networking event as well as volunteer event. And it's in um, Sony and Cul Culver City. And interested parties can contact um, Michael at animationlibationstudios.com. That's him right there. He's there live. Um, Next is CSU Summer Arts. Uh, this is a two-week uh, intensive class up in Cal State Monterey. Um, sessions are run from June 27th to July 10th and July 11th to July 24th. There's two animation-related classes, one being a creature workshop for animation where they build uh, creatures in clay, uh, scan them into the computer and animate them. And the second is with Nickelodeon Animation Studios, um, learning how to make a pitch for uh, TV shows with Nickelodeon, artists from Nickelodeon. So for more information, um, um, calstate.edu slash summer arts. And there's um, scholarships for this as well. 80% of the students receive scholarships. And there's currently a contest at um, CTN Recruiting um, for a $2,000 scholarship for this class. So go check it out. Um, we have two more. Um, the Global Game Jam. It is um, functioning like a hackathon. 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 Interesting. Doesn't tight. I don't know. It's held annually in January in over 600 locations uh, worldwide during the same weekend. At each location, participants meet up, form groups, and spend 48 hours building a game. The games are uploaded to global, globalgamejam.org. Um, there are likely to be at least four or five locations in the greater LA area. Um, check the Global Game Jam website in November for signups. And the actual jam um, goes in, from, in January from the 20th to the 22nd. And it's a fun educational activity introducing new corners to game development and allowing experienced developers to build their skills and portfolios. No experience necessary to participate. And finally, uh, the CSU Media Arts Festival for um, all the faculty that have students with films. 
Um, the entry deadline is uh, May 19th, 2016, so that's coming up. Um, and it's an opportunity for students of the California State University to receive professional review and feedback of projects in films, television, screenplay, and new media. Finalists are screened at the CSU Media Arts Festival in the fall, and winners receive awards and cash prizes. Um, it's a $15 entry fee, and there's no limit on the number of entries. All entrants and CSU students are invited to attend the MAF in the fall. Date will be announced soon. Interested parties may contact S. Pringle at calstate.edu. And those are our events coming up. Very nice. Very Thank nice. you. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, break our online f um, for lunch, and we'll resume at 1:30. And uh, people in the room here are invited to have lunch, uh, even though the coffee bean is closed next door. All the tables and chairs are there and everything. So if you want to sit more comfortably, or you could sit out on the grass, whatever. And um, we'll we'll look at some VR stuff right now as well. And yeah. And do it out. Yeah, yeah. And and um and for the virtual world we will see you in one hour. Okay, so tune back in. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have some donuts. That's right. And pizza's coming. And pizza's coming.